آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته I greet you with the greeting of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace and blessings. May the peace and blessings of God Almighty be upon you. My name is Omar Rifai. It is my honor today to welcome you to this event featuring our esteemed guest and speaker, Vigo Pella. On behalf of the Islamic Center of the Capital District, Al Hidayah Center, in Masajid al Salam, Al Arqam, and the Nabawi. We welcome you all. We thank you for coming, whether you came to learn, to support, or to express your solidarity with your brothers and sisters in humanity. It is now more important than it ever has been to build bridges between communities and to work tirelessly together to promote peace and justice. Today's agenda will be as follows. First, Sheikh Mustafa will open by reading verses from the Holy Quran, which we will follow with a translation. Then we will invite our guest speaker to the stage. Miko will present for 45 minutes and we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A. Following the Q&A session, there will be refreshments served in the lobby prior to the Mahara prayer. Please hang on to the tickets you were given at the door uh, for the opportunity to uh, win a signed copy of Miko's latest book. With that, I humbly invite Sheikh Mustafa for the recitation. I'm 
كثيرا إن أحسنتم أحسنتم لأنفسكم وإن أسأتم فلها فإذا جاء وعد الآخرة ليسوءوا وجوهكم ليسوءوا وجوهكم وليدخلوا المسجد كما دخلوه أول مرة وليتبروا ما علوا تتبيرا عسى ربكم أن يرحمكم عسى ربكم أن يرحمكم وإن عدتم عدنا وجعلنا جهنم للكافرين حصيرا بارك الله فيكم وجزاكم الله خير أنا الكاميرا
Sure. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Omar, for the introduction. Imam Mustafa. Thank you to uh, Sister Ilham for organizing this, working tirelessly to bring me back to Albany. <laughs> and to the Islamic Center for putting this event together. I was at the Islamic Center in Piscataway, New Jersey, just a couple of weeks ago. And um, yeah, holding events for Palestine, certainly, but holding events in Islamic centers and in, 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 Muslim, in, uh, in mosques in Muslim spaces, it always feels like a safe space, a space where we can talk, when we can agree or disagree, but there's always a sense of peace. And so I appreciate the invitation to come and speak here. Thank you once again. I was watching CNN just before coming here, and they're reporting that thousands are marching in the capital in Washington, D.C. Um, for Palestine. I think they left out a few zeros. <laughs> Two at least, if not more. And uh, we, we know that you know, when, when, when we speak up, the, the media tends to minimize our efforts, minimize our arguments, minimize the number of people who come to protest. But we know the truth. We know the truth. And I think that's good enough. And I think this is true for the entire issue of Palestine. While well, the other side is busy making up stories after stories after stories, continuously and consistently building lies upon lies upon lies, we have the most important tool of them all. We have possession of the truth. Because the story of Palestine <coughs> is the truth. When we talk about the history of Palestine going back thousands of years, when we talk about the more recent history of Palestine, the 20th century, the second half of the 20th century, or whether we're talking about what is taking place in Palestine since October the 7th. While the other side is busy putting together lies upon lies, trying to make entire arguments based on slogans and bumper stickers, we have the context, we know the truth, and that's why I firmly believe that we and when I say we, I mean all people who care for Palestine and for justice will prevail. And like I said, I was in Piscataway just a few weeks ago. Stormy night, it was a Saturday night, rain and snow, it was freezing cold. And there must have been, like here, maybe three or four hundred people came to listen and to participate in the conversation. And again, here we are, and look at this room full of people who care enough to spend an afternoon talking and listening and engaging in this important conversation about Palestine. And when people say, well, how do we maintain hope about Palestine when things are so, so drastically horrible, so horrifying? Well, this is how we keep hope. We look around us, we see our sisters and brothers coming together in city after city after city. and I. I travel a great deal anyway, but since October the 7th, I've been, this has been you know, a lot more than I've ever done before. And it's not only me, it's others who speak for Palestine. Country after country, since I was here last time, I've been to several, several states here in the United States. I've been to Australia, I'm back. And you see halls filled with people who care about Palestine. And you see protests everywhere with hundreds of thousands, if not millions, marching and demanding justice for Palestine and the end of the violence against Palestinians. And that, I believe, is what, how we keep going. That is how we maintain hope, by seeing, sitting together, engaging and doing everything we can for Palestine and for our sisters and brothers in Palestine. It's very interesting that the events of October 7th became an issue of contention, an issue about pe which people argue as though that there could be several versions to the truth. And the interesting thing as well, another interesting thing is that when the other side, the side that promotes violence and racism, talks about the events of October the 7th, the basic premise is lies. Lies that are based on racism. 
lies that they hope the world will accept because they depend on the racist ears. They depend on this fertile ground of racism that exists, whether it's in the United States or in Europe, and that these racist ears will accept these lies because of their racism. But what we know is that after decades upon decades, almost a hundred years, 75, 76 years of brutal oppression, brutal oppression, ethnic cleansing, a campaign of genocide and erasure, of an erasure where an entire country was taken, the name of the country was changed, the name of cities were changed, towns and villages were erased off the face of the earth, countless of civilians were massacred and then forced into exile, and others forced into exile. On October the 7th, Palestinian fighters came out of one of the poorest and most oppressed areas in the world an area that is called the Gaza Strip. And they came by air on gliders. They came by sea in small vessels. And they came by foot, by stepping over the fence into a country that's theirs, into a land that's theirs. A land, a country that they are prevented from going back to a land and a country that are rightfully theirs. They broke away from this prison, or as a good Palestinian friend of mine from Gaza, Yusuf al-Jamal says, from a concentration camp that had been turned into a death camp. And they came out to fight for the freedom, to express their, anger, to express their desire for freedom and for liberation. They managed to take almost half of Palestine. It took the Nakba. 22 Israeli cities and settlements were taken by the Palestinian fighters. <coughs> they took the military base that was supposed to prevent them from ever coming in, the headquarters of the Gaza Brigade. They took it. And in doing all of this, they humiliated the great army of Israel, they humiliated the so-called great intelligence apparatus of the state of Israel, and they basically paralyzed the state of Israel for weeks, rather months, because the state of Israel is still in a state of chaos and paralysis. Chaos and paralysis. Citizens didn't know what to do, where to go, where the danger was, who was protecting them, they were not defended. And by the way, for those of us who are old enough to remember, I don't think it's a coincidence that this happened exactly 50 years and one day after the 1973 October War, where again, the state of Israel was, 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 was subjected to a surprise attack. The Israeli military, the Israeli intelligence were humiliated. This attack, of course, is far more, was far more successful militarily, even though Palestinians have never had an army. They don't have tanks. They don't have warplanes. They came by gliders. These are people who, like I said, live in the poorest, one of the poorest, most oppressed areas in the world, where there's no access to proper nutrition, no access to water fit for human consumption, no access to the most basic medical care. So immediately we heard about all the atrocities that they committed. And the hope was that racist people around the world would accept these stories of atrocities because what else could we expect from Palestinians? Obviously, if Palestinians are armed, they will commit atrocities. Well, most people around the world didn't buy it. 
the mainstream media is perpetuating these lies, politicians are perpetuating these lies, spokespeople for the other side are perpetuating these lies weeks and weeks and weeks after they're all found to be lies. But nobody wants to ruin a good story with the facts or with the truth, so they continue to perpetuate these lies. But the support for Palestinians is growing. Popular support, popular opinion is growing day by day, moment by moment. The call for justice for Palestinians is growing day by day, moment by moment. People are becoming more courageous. People are risking more, risking their jobs, risking their futures. Students on campuses, faculty on campuses are speaking up and losing their jobs, being fired, being suspended. I was at the University of Indiana just a few weeks ago. It was an event organized by a student group. And the administration at the last minute decided they were going to um, cancel the room. And the students decided they were going to occupy the room, which they did, and we had the event. The faculty advisor has just been suspended because of that. So these colleges, these universities, instead of being proud of the fact that they have such courageous students, Students are willing to stand up for what is right, put their names up on a billboard, praising them. They punish them, and they punish the faculty that supports them. That's how absurd this has become. But like I said, we know the truth. And the students know the truth, and these institutions will one day apologize. They will apologize. And they will put the names of these brave students on billboards with pride because these students are a source of pride to their families, to their parents, to their communities, and to the institutions where they're studying. There's no question about that. There can be no question about that. <coughs> and like I said, these, um, these young fighters who came out of the Gaza Strip, these young Palestinian fighters, who, who, it took weeks, by the way, for the Israeli military to take the fighting back into the Gaza Strip, and they're still fighting. And they're still fighting. Now, the state of Israel, having been humiliated, the Israeli military having been humiliated, responded just like any criminal organization, any gang, any bully would respond. They looked for the weakest, most vulnerable place in which they can take out their revenge, and that's what we've been seeing. An estimated 25,000 civilians dead. Defenseless, civilians butchered, massacred on prime time. Because that's what a gangster does. When a gangster is humiliated, they have to take out their revenge on a weak, defenseless victim. Fighting soldier to shoulder, fighter to fighter, the Palestinians have shown clearly that they are superior. And they're still showing it with whatever little means they have, with no logistical support, no international support, they prevail. Now, the world will apologize for allowing this to go on. But for the 20, 30,000 Palestinians who, are, who, who were killed, this will be too late. And for the God knows how many tens of thousands injured, this will be too late. But people always ask the question, how do you maintain hope and how do we stay hopeful when things are so severe? Well, like I said, one thing is seeing so many people who care and want to talk and want to do something and want to act, particularly now, people really want to act. But hope is not something, I don't believe that hope is something that comes from outside of us. Hope is something that we create. What does hope look like? What does hope look like? We have to determine what hope looks like and then we fight to bring that and, and make that the reality. That's what hope is. It doesn't come from nothing. It doesn't come to us from outside. People tend to have this desire to wait for somebody to come and save the world, to come and save reality, to wait for Salah Adin to come and save us. Well, we are Salah Adin. Salah Adin is sitting in every single chair today. 
And we are the ones who have to bring about the change. And nobody else is going to do it. And we are the ones who have to create the hope for us and for our sisters and brothers in Palestine. And the news is focusing on Gaza, obviously. But I was just speaking to a, a, a brother of mine in the city of Hebron, Al Khalil, Isa Amra, who was a very, very important activist in, in Hebron. Probably one of the most important, most effective human rights defenders in Palestine. <coughs> Palestinians are prevented from going out in the street. People can't go to buy food. Children have been there, there are no schools. A city of over 200,000 people, there is no school. Shops are closed. The settlers are going crazy with guns, uniforms and guns. Checkpoints, even more than there were before, and the city of Hebron in particular, is like uh, apartheid created in a lab. Imagine apartheid created in a lab, that is the city of Hebron. The pre-October 7 days were the good old days. It is far, far worse today for Palestinians everywhere in Palestine. In the Nakba, in Jerusalem, in Yaffa, Lid, in Haifa, everywhere, throughout all of Palestine. Things are more severe now than they've ever been before, and we all know how severe things were for Palestinians before October the 7th. So the question remains, how is it that the media, the politicians, decision makers, are not getting the message. They're not getting the message. There's a president in this country who proudly associates himself with Zionism and wants us to believe that he opposes racism. There are university administrators who support Zionist groups on campus, yet they say they have zero tolerance for racism. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. Are you for racism or against racism? You can't have it both ways. If anybody has not heard of Zionism and does not know what Zionism is, look at the history of Palestine over the last 75 years. It's a history of racism and violence. That's what it is. So how could you possibly support it while you say you support peace? Or how can you support that while you say you support or you, have, you want to have zero tolerance for racism? You can't have it both ways. And God forbid to claim that we are anti-Zionists because the U.S. Congress just passed a resolution saying that if you're anti-Zionist, you're anti-Semitic. I want to tell you a little story. So I'm sure many of you know there's a very large group of ultra-Orthodox observant Jews who always come to pro-Palestinian uh, events, who support the cause for freedom and justice in Palestine. It's a huge community in New York. There are large communities in London, and in Palestine, and Jerusalem, and other places. And when they come, and I, I, I'm very close to them, I'm actually working on a book about them, and I've been to their homes, and I know these rabbis very well. And um, they called me just a few days ago because they were expecting a large contingent coming down from New York to DC for the protest, and, they, the, the, and they, when they come, they have to bring their own food and their own everything for their, for their uh, worship and so on, because, you know, Saturday is the Sabbath, Shabbos. And the place they always used to go to was closed down, so they're asking me if I know anybody who might have a space where they can worship and congregate and so on. And so I called around, and then I remembered that I had a Palestinian friend who lives in an apartment complex that has kind of an events room, so I connected them with him. And then I thought, isn't that interesting? A young Palestinian is helping ultra orthodox Jews to find a place to worship so that they can come and participate in a protest for Palestine. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how it's supposed to work. And by the way, that was the reality in Islamic world, that was the reality in the Arab world, and that was the reality in Palestine before the Zionists came. Ask the Jews, the Jewish community who resided in Jerusalem, in Hebron, and other cities before the Zionists came. 
They babysat each other's, uh, they babysat for each other. They took care of each other, they're the neighbors. That's how it's supposed to be. And that is where we are going. That needs to be where we are going. That needs to be our objective. And it is possible because it was possible. And while now there is this force of racism and violence that has taken over Palestine and has ruined these relations, it's not, it's not irreparable. Because there are still good people that are willing to bring about change and are willing to see, to create that again. And you know what's interesting? A lot of people don't know this. And again, referring to this ridiculous um, resolution by Congress that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews are anti-Zionists, have always been. So they're all somehow anti-Semitic. It doesn't make any sense. But I started getting interested in this phenomenon of these ultra-Orthodox Jews. Why are they in a position to the state of Israel? Why do they oppose Zionism so you know, and they get beat up in Jerusalem when the Israeli authorities come in, they beat them up, they arrest them because they refuse to serve in the army. And they protest, every week they protest for Palestine and against the military. And I learned something very interesting. In the year 1900, Zionism was just in its infancy. The rabbis, the important rabbis around the world saw a danger. And they put out a book, a warning for Jewish people of the dangers of Zionism and the dangers of this notion of the Jewish state in Palestine. And what they said was basically three things. And this is what they're saying today. They said Zionism will bring violence to the Holy Land. They said this in 1900. Check. They said Zionism will ruin the good relations between Jews and Muslims and Jews and Arabs. Check. And they said, Zionism will create doubt as to the loyalty of Jewish people or citizens of countries around the world. Because Jewish people are not a nation with a shared country or a shared language. Like Islam, they are a nation that is connected by its faith. That's why you can have a Russian Jew and an Iraqi Jew and a Yemeni Jew and a, an American Jew. They don't speak the same language, but they share the same faith. And that's what Judaism is. So they said these things, and they presented this warning over 100 years ago, and they were absolutely right about this. Now, when I travel, as I do, it's very interesting because the questions that I get and the issues that people bring up in the Q&A, which I believe is usually the more important part of every presentation, are very similar. And a few years, I live in Washington, D.C. now, and a few years ago, I came to this realization. And we talked about this last night, we were at the other side of the center. There is a void. There's a void that exists in Washington, D.C., in capitals around the world. And that void is represented when you see the popular support for Palestine on one hand, on one hand and the lack of representation for the support in the decision-making spaces, whether it's local politics or national politics. We don't see that support for Palestine represented anywhere. And of course the question is why? Why are American administrations, European governments, so supportive of Israel for so many years? That is probably the most common question that I get. Now let's look, about them, look at this for a moment. For over 100 years, the Zionists have been dedicated to presenting a very powerful story, a very powerful narrative. And certainly since the State of Israel was established, it's even more powerful. A very compelling story of a people who have suffered, a people who were subjected to oppression, a people who were subjected to genocide in Europe and have now returned to their homeland, established a modern state, and are finally free. But their Arab neighbors, their Muslim neighbors, are trying to destroy them. And therefore, people around the world, Americans, need to support Israel. That's the narrative, and it's very compelling. If we didn't know anything about Palestine, 
And we receive the story in school, in all the public spaces we go to, in places of worship, in the press, in the movies, in common cult in popular culture, all the time. That's what we believe. In fact, I did believe, because that was I came from that. I came from that. There is no parallel on the other side. There is no parallel presenting the Palestinian story anywhere. Anywhere. I spoke to this young man, young Palestinian in Washington, D.C. a while back, and he was an intern in, a, in an office of one of the senators. And he was telling me, he said, we get 300 emails every day from one single Zionist organization called Stand With Us. 300 emails every day from one Zionist organization. Every senator, every congressman, I'll bet you every, every media outlet. The White House, for sure. When do they hear about Palestine? A few times a year when there are all these days you know, that you know, people go and volunteer and speak, you know, go to the congressional offices and speak and so on, that are organized by the various uh, pro-Palestine organizations, when there's a crisis, and that's it. Half the people you talk to, if you say Palestine, they confuse it with Pakistan. And there's nothing wrong, of course, with Pakistan, but it's not Palestine, right? The half that does, did hear about Palestine knows nothing about Palestine. The vast majority know that there's war, there's terrorism, there's this issue with the Jews, they want to kill Jews for some reason. That's what people know. They've never, ever been presented in a systemic, strategic, professional way about the story of Palestine. So a couple of years ago, I got together with a few friends and we decided to try to figure out how, we, how do we remedy that? How do we create this? Now, in Washington, D.C., you know, the embassies are everywhere, and every country has its embassy and a cultural center and a, uh, an economic center and a com economic development center. And, uh, like every embassy, every country has got three or four magnificent buildings with their flags that represent them in one way or the other. There's not a single Palestinian flag in Washington, D.C. Not one. Not one. There are more Palestinian flags in restaurants in Brooklyn than there are in Washington, D.C. None. There is not a single space in Washington, D.C. that proudly represents Palestine. Not one. There are several little NGOs, little organizations, relief organizations, but nothing that is you know, high profile. And there's no one working to present the Palestinian case. If any one of us was a member of Congress and wanted to make an informed decision, wanted to have an informed opinion on Palestine, we don't have the tools. We have piles and piles and piles of information, very compelling stories that would lead us to support Israel and nothing else, nothing about Palestine. From time to time, a Palestinian activist, a student activist or somebody will come and talk to us. And they, usually, and they never talk to the congressman, they'll, usually, they'll always talk to the staffers. Lucky if you talk to uh, the chief of staff. So like I said, a few friends of mine and I decided to see how we can remedy this. And we came up with a concept. And we're calling the concept, can you see the slide? Daru Horira, which means House of Freedom. And the vision is to create a space in Washington, D.C., a physical, high-profile place in the capital that will represent the Palestinian story, a place that people come and visit, a place that holds events, a place that, a place that talks about Palestine above and beyond the conflict, above and beyond the oppression, above and beyond 1948. Palestine is a country with an enormous culture, with a long history, literature and cuisine and, 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 and agriculture and commerce and God, everything else, archaeology. Nobody knows anything about it because nobody has ever troubled to put it in front, or like we say, placing Palestine front and center. I was asked a question a few, 
a few lectures ago by somebody, how do we put Palestine front and center? So this is what we want to do. We want to place Palestine front and center. It has to be in Washington, D.C. where decisions are made. We will not, I do not believe we will ever be able to bring about change in Palestine unless we bring about change in Washington, D.C. That's the reality. Palestinians are doing everything they can. But they are prisoners in a maximum security prison. They're doing everything they can within those confines. We have to be their voice. We have to represent them. We have to do this. And I believe we can. So we formed a, a nonprofit. We have a board, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about more of who they are and what, what, what the plan is. Um, but the vision is to have a space in Washington, D.C. that is staffed with a professional full-time staff, not volunteers, well, some volunteers perhaps, but certainly a full-time professional staff they will write the emails, they will organize the events, they will do the outreach that is needed on a regular basis, day in and day out, in order to allow decision makers and the press and the public to have an, important, an, an informed decision on Palestine, an informed opinion on Palestine. That's what we need to do. So the vision is peace. Although the word peace has become you know, cheap over the years. But the vision is peace. You know, I have a good friend, Basim Tamimi, he has one of his sons, younger sons, he's now probably 17 or 18, his name is Salam. And when he was a little boy, he came to his father and he said, I want to change my name. I don't want this name. Because the term Salam, the term peace has become cheap. Well, we need to revive it but in a smart way. So the vision is peace in Palestine, where all people who reside between, I don't know, I hope I'm allowed to say this here, the river and the sea, <laughs> you, know, you, you may know this, I was in Bethlehem at a, at, a, at a library, and I was told I'm not allowed to say from the river to the sea. In a library. Okay. So it's permissible. Alhamdulillah, thank God we're in the hospital. We're allowed to say things. We are free of speech here. Thank God. Anyway, so peace in Palestine with people who live in between the river and the sea can enjoy a normal, productive, healthy life. And the mission is to use education and advocacy. Education and advocacy, but in a full-time, professional, systemic way to bring about a free, democratic Palestine from the river to the sea and to demonstrate that that is the way for peace. Because the reality is there are only two options in Palestine. That's the reality. The one option is what we have right now. And we see where that's leading. It's not leading to peace, that's for sure. Having one part of the population, which is actually less than half now, because Palestinians are the majority by quite a lot, one half of the population privilege at the expense of the other is not going to bring peace. We see what it's bringing. But a free democratic Palestine from the river to the sea with equal rights does have a chance to bring about peace. That is the, that is the recipe for peace. So to demonstrate that, because once again, even those of us who believe this are not doing this. There's no place, there's no system, there's no strategy to demonstrate that. Our goals are to educate people in decision-making spaces in the capital, in the press, and in the public sphere, and also, I would add, into the diplomatic core, because the diplomats, even from countries who supposedly support Palestine, are ignorant. And I mean, they have other issues, so you can't really maybe blame them, but they need to be informed. And in Washington, D.C., there's just traditions where all of these spaces that represent other countries they hold events, they hold lectures, they hold cultural events. They're really a place that people like to go to. And we need that place. We need that kind of a space for Palestine. And to amplify Palestinian voices. When was the last time anybody heard from Palestinians, Bedouin in the Nakab? Nobody even knows that there are such a thing. Almost half a million Palestinian citizens of Israel live in the Nakab and they are the poorest of the poor among the, what's called, the citizens of Israel. While 
the Israeli settlements in the Nakab, you know, the Nakab is a, is a desert, it's a very fertile desert. The Israeli settlements in the Nakab enjoy the highest standard of living, and living among Israelis because it's such a beautiful uh, and, and fertile place. Israelis can open ranches and farming and agriculture, and it's all subsidized. The Palestinian Bedouin in the Nakab, who are farmers traditionally, are prohibited, they're not allowed to engage in farming. Anyway, amplify Palestinian voices. Now, we have board of directors, it's very small right now. You have yours truly as president and CEO, Ramzi Khorshid, a Palestinian activist with a long history of activism and hard work for Palestine. As secretary, Dr. Jim Kobe, who is a retired uh, surgeon, and since the 1964 has been continuously and consistently going to Gaza to teach and to work. He was supposed to be there now. Just before October 7, we had a trip we were supposed to go together. We're in the process of, 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 of adding more people to the board. And we have what we call our advisory board. Can you see this? Is the lighting okay? Yes. Our advisory board, who are the most active, the most well-known Palestinian activists in Palestine. And if you're involved in Palestine deeply, as I and many others are, most of these names are quite well known. Or not quite well known, are very well known. I'll, I'll briefly introduce them. Fidash Hadeh from the city of Lid. She's a member of the Lid City Council. This is within 1948. Omar Ghubari in Jerusalem. He works for uh, another nonprofit which is, which is dedicated to the memory and the, and the vision the memory of the towns and villages that were destroyed and the vision of return. Bess and Tamimi, I think the name Tamimi is well known for everybody. His daughter, his daughter, Abba Tamimi, you know, she was arrested for slapping the soldiers a few years ago. He is now in prison, by the way. What Israel did after, after October 7 is they've detained and arrested 6,000 additional Palestinians, doubling the number of political prisoners. And Bastin was actually on his way to visit Jordan, which is a simple trip normally, and he was arrested and given six months, so he's going to be in jail now for six months, if not more. And he's from Nabi Saleh, which is the West Bank, Ramallah area. You see, they're all from different regions. Hanin Zobi, who was uh, from Nazareth, a well-known activist, she was a member of the Israeli Knesset for 10 years, for Baled, an anti-Zionist organization. And Rafat Abu Aish, who's probably the youngest one, He's a, a very serious activist in the Nakba, Palestinian Bedouin. Uh, Wafai Udaini, she's a journalist from Gaza. Ahmed Abu Rafima, which I think maybe many of you will know, he was the brains behind the Gaza March of Return <coughs> that we saw several years ago. Uh, his family was killed, sadly, and he was injured during the latest bombing in, in, uh, in Gaza. He's also a journalist and an activist. Aisa Amro, the hero of Palestine, really. He's, uh, he's, in, uh, he's in Hebron. And Baha Hilo is in Bethlehem. And Manal Tamimi, also, she's also from the Bissale, also from the Tamimi family. And these are all people with a long and courageous history of activism. Some of the smartest, most courageous people in the world. I personally would follow any, any one of them into fire if they led me. I would have no hesitation. And I've known them for years and years and years. I've worked with them for years and years. I've had the privilege of calling them my sisters and brothers. And they are our connection to Palestine. Many of the organizations, the pro-Palestinian organizations in the US do not have a connection to actual Palestinian activists on the ground. This is the background. These people are the backbone of the organization. The agenda is set by them. They tell us what is happening in the Nakba. You know, some 3,000 home demolitions every year, lack of access to water, and so on and so on. They give us the information. What is happening in Al-Quds? What is happening in Lid? Every aspect of their life, of the life of Palestinians, or all of Palestine, these are very similar issues, but they're local because they can't work together. So they all work locally, and they're heroic, all, each and every one of them. The work that they do is heroic. Um, and... I was wondering to myself, and so I thought I'd share this with you, how much money is sent each year supposedly to help Palestinians, or the Palestinian Authority, since, this is since 1994, when the Oslo Accords came about and the Palestinian Authority was um, established. And this is money coming from the US, from the Europeans, from Arab countries, official money that's going to the PA. 
This doesn't really include a lot of the relief organizations. Over $1 billion. Now, why is this money needed? Why do Palestinians need aid? Palestinians have perhaps what is one of the highest literacy rates in the world among any country, any nation. In the Gaza Strip, the literacy rate is almost 100%. I think the Gaza Strip has the highest per capita PhD on Earth. Why do they need aid? Because they've been placed in a reality that they cannot produce, they cannot live, they are in prison. Prisoners need somebody to give them food and to give them water. They can't do it themselves. Palestinians need aid? That's absurd. But they've been placed under this oppressive apartheid regime where they have no choice. So the Palestinian Authority was created to create the illusion that there's some kind of a Palestinian state, which of course we know is not true. And they, need, they pay salaries to their people. And that little money goes here and there to other things. But over one billion dollars, if Palestinians had freedom, they'd be producing more than anybody can imagine. They don't need aid. I mean, they need it now because the situation is so severe, but it's absurd. And none of this money, of course, or I should say all of this money comes at a price. And what is that price? No resistance. No resistance. There's a price to this. Of course, it hasn't stopped Palestinians from resisting, but that is the official agreement. So none of this money goes to help Palestinians actually free Palestine, receive liberation, none of it. The opposite is true, I think. And it doesn't help the vast majority of Palestinians, it helps particular institutions, and particularly the Palestinian Authority, which as we all know, works more for Israel than it does for the Palestinians. So what would it take to free Palestine? How much money would it take? Nobody knows because nobody ever sat down to figure it out, as far as I know. What would it take? What is needed? We believe, and I say we, I mean me and the people that I just shared with you, and many others that are part of our team. We have a team of lawyers and a team of experts in Washington, D.C. that were you know, working putting this together. We believe the daughter Haria is one big block, building block, that will lead to a free Palestine. Because when we change the conversation, when we change the discourse in Washington, D.C., when we change the reality in Washington, D.C., when we come to a place where the conversation of a free democratic state on all of historic Palestine, from the river to the sea, with equal rights is the way to go. The road from there to an actual free Palestine it will be rather short. And unless that is presented in a compelling, strategic, professional way, a free Palestine will remain a dream. And Palestinians have been dreaming long enough. And those of us who care for Palestine have been dreaming long enough. It's time to make it a reality. It's time to do what is needed, to put the building blocks to support these brave, our brave sisters and brothers in Palestine. That's how we do it. So we came, we said, okay, what do we need? We need a building. Real estate is rather expensive in Washington, D.C., but we need a building, we need the staff, we need salaries, we need an executive director. We need marketing, we need polling. These are all things that we need, right? I mean, we put together a budget, we came up with about $3 million. Compare that to one billion. Maybe we're off by a million. Maybe we're off a little bit, we'll figure it out. But that, we're not talking about a great deal of amount of money. But without that money, nothing's gonna happen. So, we started this campaign of fundraising, and the goal is to put Palestine front and center. That is the goal. And we're a nonprofit, so all donations are tax deductible. This, uh, the official name of the, of the nonprofit is Education for Peace and Understanding, operating as Dara um, Horia. This is the, this QR code is, will take you to, you know, a place where you can make a donation. 
I think when you go there, the, 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 it says $100, but you can put any amount you want. These are suggested amounts, of course, but you can put any amount you want. And we need to get to work. We need to get to work, friends. We need to get to work. When we, I believe that as soon as we are operational in terms of having a building and a staff, the change will be very dramatic. Very dramatic. I believe within five years we will completely change the story. Now, grant you this, if today was 1988 or 1989, and somebody sat, came up here and said, in four or five years, Nelson Mandela will be president of a free post-apartheid South Africa. What will we say? That's utopia, that's not impossible. In 1994, Nelson Mandela was already president of a free South Africa. He was already president of a free South Africa. So when the change begins, if we have a, if we have a, a, a good strategy, if we have the best minds working together, if we all work together and participate in the conversation, we can make it happen. But it has to be institutionalized. It has to be organized. It has to be done in a professional way with a very clear intention of freeing Palestine. Not dreaming about a free Palestine, but creating a free Palestine. Now, what am I doing standing here talking about a free Palestine? You heard about my background. Some of you may have read my book, The General Son. I was raised in the Zionist family. The most Zionist patriotic family you could possibly imagine. My grandfather signed Israel's Declaration of Independence. I had a great uncle who was the president of the state of Israel. My father was a general, and not just a general, but he was a member of that generation of generals that are still to this day held in Israel like gods of the Olympus. The generals of 1967. So what in the world am I doing here talking like this? Well, at one point, and the subtitle of the General Son is Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. And I embarked on a journey that took me from this very, very safe and privileged sphere of an Israeli in Palestine into the real Palestine. And the realization I came that in the realization that I came to, to, the reality that I came to realize was, it was taken on October 7th, it's called Be'eri, Kibbutz Be'eri, you may have heard of it, it's been in the news a lot, and a kibbutz is a nice little community, kind of a commune that was created by the Zionists. Kind of an agriculture, semi-agricultural, semi-industrial, you know, a few hundred families, and they created these beautiful spaces where kids run around, you know, barefoot, and there's a swimming pool, and there's grass growing, and the wonderful schools, and, all, and, you know, as much water as they want, of course. And I used to go there, I had cousins in that place, in, in Beirut, it's in the Nakba, three kilometers from the Gaza Strip. And um, most of my family already left there, but I still had a cousin, uh, two cousins who are a little bit older, who still live there. And they were hiding in their small house, because people live in small houses there. Uh, they were hiding in their house for about three weeks before they were told they could you know, they could leave. Um, and in all the years that I used to go there, and enjoy summers there, and weekends there, and go down with my grandmother, it was a big family affair, it was so much, nobody once even mentioned what was happening three kilometers away. The three kilometers away, millions of people are living in a concentration camp. Because Gaza was always a concentration camp. It's always been a concentration camp. Sometimes there was a little more, there was a little more freedom. Sometimes there was less freedom. Nobody ever said a word about that. That's the reality in which I was raised. We live in this wonderful little place, and there's Arabs, and these Arabs are troublemakers. And what are you going to do? They want to kill us. So that journey into Palestine, meeting Palestinians, you know, working closely with these sisters and brothers that I showed you earlier, is how I end up being here saying we have to operate, we have to do everything we can to dismantle the apartheid state and to create a free, democratic Palestine 
from the river to the sea with mechanisms to allow the refugees to return. Full stop, that is the mission. So I want to invite everybody here to join me on this mission so that we can all see a free Palestine soon. Thank you very much. Because they are. 
You know, and many of the Israelis that were killed, turns out, was killed by were killed by the Israeli military themselves. You know, but the but the, the, the racist ears are ready for this kind of stuff. So it's very easy for him to say that. It's very easy for him to do that. And again, all of these years, he has never been presented with a Palestinian story. You care about head, babies being beheaded? You know what happens to babies in a building when a one-ton bomb falls on, the, on their building? You know how they die? You want to get into details of what happens to these little bodies of babies and children when a one-ton bomb made in the United States is dropped by an Israeli uh, warplane on, on, on an apartment building? You want to talk about that? You want to get into the details on the thousands and thousands and thousands of babies that have been murdered by Israel over the years? Fine, let's have that conversation now. That has never been presented. That is not on the table. That challenge has never been presented, and that's precisely what we want to do. Hi, Miko. I'm from Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. Hello. Have you been banned from the... the we have been banned from the library for a full year. <laughs> and we go to every board meeting and sit there for three hours and we get a three-minute sound bite to speak our case. I, I don't have a question for you. I mean, I have a million, but I wanted to thank you for... And I'm so glad I could come today because when you were at the library, I didn't get to hear one tenth of what you had to say because of the constant. It was a war zone. Yeah. It was a war zone. <laughs> it was a war zone. I didn't hear anything you had to say, and, and we had all kinds of consternation going on um, from the audience. And as a result, we've been banned from the library for a year. So there goes our first amendment. But I thank you for coming back and being courageous. Well, of course, you're in a safe place now. Um, so I would like to. Thank you. You've been to Bethlehem uh, at least two times, and we've represented you one time before, and we will continue to do it. But I would like to let everybody know that on Monday nights, we have a vigil at the Four Corners in Delmar. Anybody is welcome to come and bring a sign. Most of ours say, war is not the answer, free Palestine, cease war, whatever. But we invite anybody to come and support this cause, and we're probably going to be doing a vigil out in front of the library one of these days. But, so, thank you again. Thank you. We go to a quick announcement, and we'll get back to the questions. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Tamar Nabi. I'm part of the leadership team at Hidayah. Uh, Sister Oham figured that this would be a good segue, uh, given the announcement that was just made. So. We have Leslie Hudson, Jim Hudson, Trudy Quaif is somewhere here, I think, in the, in the line. Um, we have to support Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. As Leslie mentioned, <laughs> as Leslie mentioned, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace did host Nico about a month ago at the beginning of December. That was the first opportunity that many of us had to hear him speak. The library, uh, decided to hold an emergency meeting the night before because of opposition to Miko's lecture, planned lecture. And the Zionists within the Bethlehem community were attempting to have that event canceled. The Bethlehem Library Board of Trustees, to their credit, supported First Amendment free speech rights and allowed the event to continue. However, the event itself was not without its own controversy. While the attendees of the event a lot of people that, were, that are here right now were peaceful and civil. The, the event itself was attempted to be disturbed multiple times by those same Zionists that were there the night before and had a forum to voice their concerns. They chose to be there, they didn't have to be there. In the aftermath of the event, which was disturbed multiple times, including when Miko mentioned from River to the Sea, in the aftermath of that event, the Bethlehem, the Bethlehem Library decided to prohibit the Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace from booking one of the public meeting rooms for up to a year. That punishment has been implemented. We spoke with the Board of Trustees earlier in the week. And what the Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace need is our support. Just as they were there to support us time and time again, we urge you to go to the Bethlehem uh, Library website. There's a section on the website for their Board of Trustees, and you can write a message right there in support of that. So please, show up for them as they show up for, for us. Thank you very much.
folks here are running out of time, so please try to keep the questions brief, and Nico will be available in the lobby uh, for some discussion later as well. Thank you very much for a very illuminating lecture. But I want to say that I read Abai Ban's The History of My People nearly 50 years ago, in which he acknowledged. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Deep. There you go. Go ahead. Yeah. A sentence from Abai Ban has always stuck in my mind where he acknowledged that the Jewish people had lived in peace of all the places which was in Palestine, in, in the Arab countries. They were discriminated elsewhere, mostly in, in Europe. And uh, the discussion on Zionism was not implemented in one year. It was discussed for a very, very long time. Balfour was the one who supported as a state basically Zionism in 1904 that there should be a country for the Jewish people. Maybe, maybe because he did not want Jewish people to come to the United Kingdom. So he was supporting this, this concept of Zionism. Because of the discussion over a long time period, why the leaders in this movement chose Zionism over another possibility in Palestine where the Jewish had started migrating as early as 1865 with an aim of making it a nation there. Why did they choose Zionism over possibility of having a nation living with Palestinian in peace yeah. for both people? Yeah. Well, there are several reasons why the, the Europeans and the Americans chose to support Zionism, but and two are probably are the ones that stand out the most. The first one is that the Zionists put together a very, very strong team, kind of like a diplomatic corps, long, you know, in, in those times, in the early 20th century. My grandfather was one of them. I have a poster advertising lectures that he gave in Europe, you know, as a young man, supporting the Zionist cause. And the Europeans came from a place of Zionism already, Christian Zionism, which preceded the Jewish Zionism. You know, evangelical Christians had this Zionist vision before the Jews, the Jewish Zionism developed. And so they had this, they believed in this cause, this, this messianic, um, mythical idea that the Jews returned to the Holy Land and all of this kind of stuff. So they already believed in this anyway, for religious reasons. And then they saw these, you know, secular Jews who didn't look like Jews. You know, they shaved their beards, they wore suits, they spoke many languages, they were highly educated people, and they thought, well, we can work with these people. So the Zionists put a lot of work into this. They com com combined that, with their very good propaganda, with what already existed, is a, you know, a Zionist religious belief, if you will, ideology, which was the Christian evangelical Zionists. And they combined it together. So for them, it was, it was obvious that this was the right thing to do. And these were the powerful countries in the world. This was true in America, this was true in Europe, and of course in the UK. And that's why they chose it. And today, they choose it because there's no other option presented. There's no other option presented. Nobody's out there presenting what you said, which is, I believe as well, is the right choice, which is a, a, a country where Jews and Palestinians can live together in peace. That's never presented as a possibility. They're always presented as being at odds. And that's precisely what we're doing here. That's precisely the purpose of this. Hey folks, we have time for one more question. I apologize. Thank you, Nico, for your wonderful talk. Uh, you were talking about Palestine front and center as a way of putting pressure on the United States leadership <coughs> so they would change, we could vote. Our two parties are extremely similar now, more so I think than they've ever been before. And we don't really live in a democracy, so our government doesn't really care what we think. What they do care about is their own power, and one of those aspects of power is having control in the Middle East and having their colony or their, their outpost in the Middle East. How do you reconcile our lack of democracy with the notion that all we need to do is put pressure and educate our government? Well, we need to start somewhere. So, well, granted, there are all these other interests, right? But, you know, I think it's important to remember apartheid South Africa controlled all of Southern Africa. 
all the way up to Angola. They had gold, they had uranium, and they had nuclear power. And America did not want to lose that relationship at all. Apartheid fell, even with all of that power. You know, apartheid fell. Now, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa had a lot of allies. Palestinians are orphans. The allies that Palestinians have are they're not the kind of allies that apartheid South Africa had. They had the ANC, they had the Soviet Union, they had Cuba, they had these some serious allies. They were the non-aligned countries at the time that supported, you know, supported justice for, for, for black South Africans. Palestinians are orphans. Israel has 40 diplomatic missions in Africa. They have, you know, they've normalized with the Arab and, Arab and are now they're normalizing in the Muslim world and so on. So we have to do this. We have to have somebody representing the Palestinian cause in a way that is, like I said, compelling, strategic, and high profile. We have to do that. Now, can we convince? We don't need to convince. We need to present. We need to be there so that we can challenge them once they do have the facts. We can't challenge somebody for making the wrong decision if they don't have the if they don't have all the information. And right now they don't have. And I've speak, I've spoken to many former, you know, retired politicians. They all say the same thing. They say the Zionists live in our offices. And it's true, if you ever visit the commercial offices, you see tables, chairs, and the Zionists. Always there. <laughs> Always there. They live there. We are hardly ever there. And when we're there, we barely get an appointment. It's hard to get an appointment. So we have to combat that. And I think if we combat that and we do it successfully, we are going to change the story. So please, you know, I invite everybody to support that. Thank you so much for being here. I snuck myself in and stayed resilient, so I'm going to say the Times of Israel, not exactly a bastion of progressivism, has recorded that Netanyahu and other leaders have supported Hamas for years, they created Hamas, they paid Hamas in briefcases of cash, and they ignored a year's worth of warnings before October 7th. So, my question is, is there a non-zero chance that they put their heads together and since Bibi wants to save his own skin and everybody wants to level Gaza and get up beachfront property and cleanse the area, is there a non-zero chance that they let this happen? Thank you. I, I don't believe any of that, no. I don't believe, I don't think it's true that Israel uh, created Hamas. I mean, there's no, there's no proof of that whatsoever. In my book, which is available here, The Injustice, I write a great deal about Hamas. Because the story is about the Holy Land Foundation, which some of you may know was the largest Muslim charity in America at the time. And they were accused of material support for Hamas. There's no basis, there's no foundation for the claim that Israel created Hamas. I think it's part of the attempt to discredit Hamas. To say, well, Israel created it, these are just puppets, they're no good, they're nothing, they're not representing Palestinians. So I don't believe it's true, and I also don't believe for one second that the Israelis knew about the October 7th events. They are, I think the entire military and intelligence apparatus of Israel is a paper tiger. And every time it was challenged, we saw that it was a paper tiger, because every time they're challenged, they lose. They're defeated every single time they're challenged. And then they go and they take their revenge on defenseless, uh, defenseless victims. So I, I don't think these are true, and again, and about Netanyahu, I don't think Netanyahu is any danger of losing his seat either. I think he's very, very safe. I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and like I said earlier today, he may well end up being the prime minister, uh, the equivalent of the clerk who ends, who has to, you know, declare the end of apartheid in Palestine. So he may well be that one. But we're going to need a lot of help before that happens. Sure. Thank you. Okay, folks, in a moment we'll be inviting you to head to the lobby for refreshments. Miko will be at a table signing uh, books. If you do have the intent to purchase a book, you can have a signed copy. Uh, we will also be announcing the winners of the raffle. So if you have the tickets now that you came in with, you have a chance to win a signed copy.